Okay, folks, let's make a start. Um, welcome everyone to our service here at Charleston Community Church. Um, I'm just going to give a couple of notices before we begin our service. Uh, first of all, to say on the 9th of March, Saturday the 9th of March, um, oh, this coming Saturday, we're doing like a kind of renovation day. Uh, renovation maybe is a bit too grand. Uh, restoration. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to do a deep clean inside the building here and just touch up some things. And then outside the building, we're going to sort out the shutters and um, all the stuff that needs done sorted outside. But in order to do that, we need help. Um, so if you are able to be around on Saturday the 9th, even just for an hour, uh, just any amount of time uh, to help with cleaning inside or the stuff outside, uh, please speak to Tim or speak to Bev. And start at 10. We're starting at 10. Um, so actually speak to Tim, he's the man, um, and that would be great. The more help that we have, the quicker it will go and the better it will be. So um, please do come along to that if you can. Uh, this Wednesday, Seniors Lunch Club is on this Wednesday, going to do a bit of bingo. We will not be playing the headbands game after the scathing reviews from the last Seniors Lunch. So, <laughs> so we're just going to play it safe and do bingo. That's what I've learned. Don't do anything fancy just do bingo. So we'll have seniors lunch, uh, we'll be this Wednesday, we'll do bingo, we'll do a bit of Bible talk as usual, um, and it'll be great if you know anyone who is over 60 or if you're in that category yourself, please do come along to it, um, we'd love to have you. And the final big thing, the big thing I want to push today and throughout this week is the Curry and Quiz Night, which is this Friday at 7pm through in the community centre. Um, i I didn't do this again, but can I ask you just to take one of these flyers on the way out, um, take a few of them, and just pray about people that you could invite to this. It's an easy invite. It's just a curry and quiz night, um, and uh, it should be good fun. Last year when we did it, it was great fun. Uh, I promise to try and make the quiz um, more balanced. The seniors' lunch crew were very vocal on how hard it was. Um, so I'll try and again appease them uh, but um, and try and get the generational balance right as well so if you want to come along to that please do come along um, if you've invited people and uh, they've all said no then you can still come along you don't need to bring people um, just come along anyway but please do think about neighbors friends family that you can invite to this. Um, here's the main reason we are doing this. We want to connect with more people in the community um, and we want to use this as a springboard to promote this. So this is called Hope Explored. It's a three-week course um, looking at what Christianity is and how it gives hope, um, how it's true and how it gives hope. And so we are starting that on Tuesday the 12th of March at 7 p.m. And so at the Curry and Quiz now, I'm going to talk just a little bit about Hope Explored, show a wee video, and hopefully that'll be a, a helpful way of encouraging others who are at that night to come along to this event. Uh, if you cannot make it to the Curry and Quiz night because you've got something that's extremely important, um, then you can still come along to Hope Explored. And maybe you've been having conversations with friends, family, neighbors, and they've been asking you questions about Christianity. Um, this would be a great thing to invite them to. We'll have some flyers uh, next week and at the Curry and Quiz Night that you can take um, as well. And you can invite them along to this. It's Tuesday, the 12th of March, 7 p.m., and it's going to be here in the church building. Uh, just a three-week course looking at what Christianity is. So, um, yeah, again, um, you might be thinking, oh, I'm, I'm not going to go to that. I would just ask you really to prayfully consider, are there people I can invite to this? Just pray, just ask God, can you give me opportunities? Because this is a, a great opportunity to share with folks the good news of the eternal salvation of Jesus Christ. So, um, Curry and Quiz Night, take a flyer, Hope Explored, starting on the 12th, um, and the curries are going to be... Uh, oh, by the way, if you want to cook a curry as well, speak to Rachel. Right, okay. If we, okay, we're going to risk it now. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Right, so we need a lot of prayer. Um, <laughs> right, okay. 
<laughs> right. Um, yeah, so let's pray that none of us get food poisoning. And uh, uh, no, I'm only joking, man. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you want to help uh, with Billy cook some curry as well, speak to Rachel. And uh, it'll be a great fun night uh, for the community and a chance to promote this great course, Hope Explored. Okay, right. Um, I'm going to read now from Psalm 93, and then we're going to sing this psalm. Um, the psalms are songs in the Bible that were written thousands of years ago, and this psalm celebrates the sovereignty of God. Uh, the ancient Israelites viewed the sea as a kind of symbol of chaos and darkness and evil, and this psalm celebrates the fact that God is in control over all of it that he reigns on high above all things. And so as we come to worship him, we remind ourselves of who he is. Let me read Psalm 93, and then we'll stand and we'll sing it together. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord, the seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves, mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. This is the God we worship, the one that the wind and waves bow before. Let's stand together and we'll sing Psalm 93. Be 
As we uh, come to worship this great God who is enthroned on high, uh, we come in song and we come in prayer. Uh, we can speak to God any time, any place, because of what Jesus has done for us. And that's what we are going to do now as his church, as we come to confess our sins and seek his grace. Uh, and we also want to pray for others. And we're going to pray this week for the nation of Bangladesh. We like to pray for different countries uh, across the world and different churches that we are associated with. And so this Sunday we are praying for Bangladesh. There's around 175 million people in Bangladesh. It's a lot. 0.7% uh, would be uh, Christians. Bangladesh is a country in which there are many issues. Around 25% of the population live below the poverty line. Uh, the church there faces many difficulties. Uh, forced reconversion to Islam is an increasing threat. And since independence, the percent of the population com comprising minority sections of society has been reduced to half as a result of that. Uh, churches, though, have been growing faster than the population rate for the last 50 years, uh, particularly the church among sections of the Hindu population, and we praise God for that. A big prayer point is for leadership in the church. Uh, earlier movements brought thousands of people into the church, but the lack of trained godly leadership eventually left many believers with weak, shallow faith. Uh, poverty limits the number of full-time ministers and theological students, but churches also lack spiritually mature lay leaders. So we'll pray that the Lord of the Harvest will raise up people um, to lead his church. Um, the Bengali people, right, 240 million worldwide, remain the largest unpe unreached people group in the world. And so we'll pray that God's Spirit would work there. Closer to home, going to pray for Mark Inch Free Church. So on the uh, 7th of April, we've got a special guest coming to speak, which is Chris Davidson, possibly the happiest guy I've ever met. So if you want to meet the happiest, most jolly Presbyterian minister in history, um, make sure you're here on the 7th of April. Um, maybe that's not a high bar, is it? Um, come here. Chris is going to be preaching. Chris is a minister up at Mark Inch. It's a housing scheme in Inverness, and uh, he's a really good friend of mine as well. Um, we're going to pray for them, and we'll pray that... Um, just give thanks. A lot of people have been saved in that scheme through that church. It started off a real struggle for them, and it's amazing what's really been happening in the past two years in Mark Inch. And so we're just going to give thanks for God's work and for the many souls that have been saved and discipled through the ministry of that church. And finally, um, we have a, a number of folk that aren't here today, just through various reasons, uh, many who are sick as well. And we're going to pray in particular for Owen, who um, is uh, in hospital. He's really not doing too well at the moment, and got, seems to have a number of viruses, but uh, obviously, dear brother, a member of our church, so we're going to pray uh, for Owen and for his family and just pray that he gets a good rest just now. I imagine he's probably watching the live stream, uh, so we'll pray for him. Uh, let's pray for all these things. Father God, as we come to worship you this morning, we just stop and think about who it is we are worshipping. Father, you are not our assistant. You are the King of Kings, enthroned on high. Father, the wind and the waves bow before you. All creation bows before you, for you are the Creator, eternal, immovable, unchanging, the great God, perfect in love and holiness. Father, as we think on your greatness, we bow in our hearts. We bow in reverence before you. And we know that we are not worthy to come near you. 
For Lord, you are great and good and we are not. We are finite and we are sinful. And so as we come to worship you as your church this morning, we want to begin by confessing to you, Lord, that we are sinners who need your mercy, sinners who need your grace. Father, we have let you down in so many different ways. We confess the sins of this past week to you in the quiet of our own hearts. Those unhelpful thoughts, those selfish deeds, those careless words, the times we haven't loved people, the times that we haven't loved you. Father, if you were to count our sins, it would be so numerous. We could not stand before you, great and mighty God. And yet, Father, as we confess our sins, we are also grateful that we can approach you as a father because Jesus Christ has come and suffered the punishment for our wrong. Jesus, the great God of all, who told the wind and the waves to be quiet, is the God who has rescued and saved us from all our wrongdoing. And so we praise you, Jesus, that you have taken that sin and you have dealt with it, and we are forgiven and loved for all eternity. We praise you that you have done that for us. We lift up your great name, and we worship you for your great love and grace that has been shown towards us. Father, we know we don't deserve any of it, but we have been given everything in Jesus. And Father, we pray that this great gospel would spread throughout the world, throughout the nations, Father, our heart is for the scheme here in Charleston, but we also want to see your gospel go to all nations because you are the God of all nations. And so we pray in particular, Lord, for the people of Bangladesh, the nation of Bangladesh. Father, we ask that you would protect your church against any ill treatment that they might face. We ask, Father, that they would be confident in your love and your saving power and the fact that you are enthroned on high. Father, we pray that your gospel would go out in that nation, that it would hold out the eternal hope of Jesus to those who are struggling, those who are in hopeless situations. Father, we pray and ask you as Lord of the harvest, would you raise up church leaders for your church in that nation? Would you raise up those that are equipped to help lead people in maturity in Christ? Father, we thank you for the growth that has happened in the last 50 years. But Father, we do pray for the Bengali people, the largest unreached people group in the world. Even 200 years after missionaries came to Bengali, we pray, Lord, that the gospel would still have that breakthrough moment that you, by your Holy Spirit, would awaken a spirit of revival that all the seeds that have been sown would come to fruition and that many Bengali people would come to know Jesus Christ and the salvation that he brings. Lord, there is no salvation outside of Jesus. And so would it be very clear and evident in that nation that they need Jesus. And Father, we want to thank you as well closer to home for what's been happening up in the scheme of Mark Inch and Inverness. Lord, we thank and praise you for saving people in that scheme. We thank and praise you that that church has grown through people coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray now that that church would have the wisdom and grace to disciple new believers in obedience to Jesus so that they would be a beacon of his grace. Father, please, would you provide leadership for them? Would you provide an elder to go and live in that community and to help uh, lead that church plan. Father, we praise you for Chris and Catherine, for all those involved in the ministry there, and we pray and ask Almighty God, would you continue to save souls and bring glory to Jesus' name. And Father, closer to home, we want to pray for our brother Owen today. Uh, we have much affection for him. And Father, we pray for him as he is struggling, as he is ill, as he is in hospital, as he has to deal with so much. And we just ask, Sovereign Lord, enthroned on high, would you uphold him even this day? Would you refresh his soul with the truths of your grace and your love for him? Would you be with him and would you restore him to full health? 
Father, be with us as we come now to study your word. Give us insight and understanding. Give us humility. And help us learn from what you have to say through your prophet Ezekiel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, folks, if you have a Bible, can you please turn it to uh, Ezekiel chapter 8, which is on page 836. Ezekiel chapter 8. Uh, 836 of the Bibles, unless you've got a mountain Bible, in which case it's, in which case it's page 626. Uh, but 836 is where we're going to be. Ezekiel chapter 8. So uh, we're doing uh, this series, looking through the book of Ezekiel. It's a book in the Bible that is not often read, partly because it's so weird and so big and so repetitive. Um, so it's quite a difficult book to get your head around. A lot Books in the Bible are different. Some books are more easier to understand than others. So Ezekiel is definitely on the difficult to understand spectrum of Bible books. So again, let me reiterate, if you haven't already and you're keen to kind of get into this book and the series that we're doing here in Charleston, uh, grab a sheet at the back. I've got an A4 sheet at the back explaining just a little bit of the historical context, the structure of Ezekiel, and on the back it's got a breakdown of all the chapters that we will be looking at so you can read ahead in preparation for Sunday service, which is a great thing to do. Um, so, Ezekiel chapter 8, here's where we are. We're going back now, we're going back 593 BC, 593 years before Christ. And this is the time when God's people were one nation, the nation of Israel. And the way that God would speak to Israel was through individuals called prophets. Uh, Ezekiel was one of those prophets. But this was a bad time to be an Israelite. You see, as a nation, they had rebelled against God for hundreds and hundreds of years. They had done some truly awful things. And so God, after constant warnings, as an act of judgment on his own people, raised up this superpower called Babylon to go in and to invade Judah, to invade Israel, and invade the capital city of Jerusalem. That's what the Babylonians did. They took out the king and they installed their own little puppet king. And then they went back to Babylon, but not before taking some prisoners from Jerusalem back with them. Uh, Ezekiel was one of those prisoners. And his message that God gives him to speak is to his fellow prisoners, his fellow exiles back in Babylon. So here's the map, just so we're reminded of it again. There's Babylon way over there on the far left. And that's where Ezekiel and his pris uh, fellow prisoners are. And then back in Jerusalem, that's where they were taken from, uh, Jerusalem and the temple. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about the mentality of most people at this time. Over here in Jerusalem, there were still quite a lot of people that had survived the first Babylonian attack. And here's what they thought. They thought, hey, we're safe. We're fine. We survived the Babylonians. God must think that we're brilliant. Uh, but the reality is that they didn't give two hoots about God. In fact, they did some horrible things uh, to God, as we're going to see today. But they thought they were fine. And over in Babylon, all the prisoners who were with Ezekiel thought, oh, we're done for. God's abandoned us. Our only hope is if we can get back to Jerusalem. And so God's message to Ezekiel, to the fellow prisoners, has been, guys, do not put your hope in going back to Jerusalem. Because there's something you need to understand. I am going to destroy that apostate city. I'm going to level it to the ground. I'm going to burn my temple. And everyone in Jerusalem is going to face my wrath. That was Ezekiel's message. Pretty much for six years, that was his message. So uh, we saw that last week. He had to kind of reenact this judgment using different signs, showing uh, people how serious it was because no one really believed that God would do that. And it's here, now in chapter 8, Ezekiel is about to receive a vision from God on what exactly is going on in Jerusalem, why it is that God is so angry. And we're going to see some of the horrible things that these people were doing in God's temple. So let's read it. It's a long reading. Brace yourself. Ezekiel chapter 8 and 9. We're going to read the start of this vision. In the sixth year... In the sixth month, on the fifth day, while well, I was sitting in my house and the elders of Judah were sitting before me, 
the hand of the sovereign Lord came on me there. I looked and I saw a figure like that of a man. From what appeared to be his waist down, he was like fire, and from there up his appearance was as bright as glowing metal. He stretched out what looked like a hand and took me by the hair of my head. The Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven, and in visions of God he took me to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court, where the idol that provokes to jealousy stood. And there before me was the glory of the God of Israel, as in the vision I had seen in the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, look towards the north. So I looked, and in the entrance north of the gate of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. He said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here that will drive me far from my sanctuary. But you will see things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance to the court. I looked, and I saw a hole in the wall. He said to me, Son of man, now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and I saw a doorway there. He said to me, Go in and see the wicked and detestable things they are doing here. So I went in and looked and I saw portrayed all over the walls all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals, all the idols of Israel. In front of them stood 70 elders of Israel and Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan, was standing among them. Each had a censer in his hand, and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own idol? They say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken this land. Again, he said, You will see them doing things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord, and I saw women sitting there mourning the god Tammuz. He said to me, Do you see this, son of man? You will see things that are even more detestable than this. He then brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord. And there, at the entrance to the temple, between the portico and the altar, were about twenty-five men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the east, they were bowing down to the sun in the east. He said to me, Have you seen this, son of man? Is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do the detestable things they are doing here? Must they also fill the land with violence and continually arouse my anger? Look at them putting the branch to their nose. Therefore, I will deal with them in anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them. Although they shout in my ears, I will not listen to them. Then I heard him call out in a loud voice, Bring near those who are appointed to execute judgment on the city, each with a weapon in his hand. And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man clothed in linen who had a writing kit at his side. They came in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now, the glory of the God of Israel went up from the cherubim where it had been, and it moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. As I listened, he said to the others, Follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter the old men, the young men and women, mothers and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. And so they began with the old men who were in front of the temple. Then he said to them, Defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go. So they went out and began killing throughout the city. While they were killing and I was left alone, I fell face down, crying out, Alas, sovereign Lord, are you going to destroy the entire remnant of Israel in this outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? He answered me, The sin of the people of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed and the city is full of injustice. They say the Lord has forsaken the land. The Lord does not see. So I will not look in them with pity or spare them. 
but I will bring down on their heads what they have done. Then the man in linen with the writing kit at his side brought back word saying, I have done as you commanded. Amen. This is God's word. It's not easy, but hopefully it will make sense when we look at it and we'll understand what it means for us today. Uh, Before we do, we are going to sing a song that reminds us of the fact that God is unchanging. Yesterday, today and forever, he remains the same. And that's good news because the Bible tells us that his mercy is new every morning. And for those who seek him, he is always faithful to forgive. So let's stand together and we'll sing Great is Thy Faithfulness. Ezekiel chapter 8. I believe all the Bible is the Word of God, every bit of it. So we don't shy away from any bit of it, even bits that are hard. And the first 24 chapters of Ezekiel are hard. I think it's hard often as well because we don't realize just how bad or how badly these people had treated the God that they claimed to follow. Now, today, What I want to think about, we're going to think about this topic, worship. And I want to say 
uh, something to all of us that maybe you might not have thought of, but it's true and it's this. Every single person, every single human being worships. We all worship. We are by our nature worshippers. And you don't have to be religious to worship. We all worship someone or something. And the way to find out what you worship is to ask yourself, what is the one thing that I need in my life for it to have value? What is the one thing that my life is built upon? Whatever it is, it is in many ways your God. You'll live for that. You'll even sacrifice for it. It could be a variety of different things. So and many people worship themselves. You know, it's your need, your comfort that dictates how you live your life. People worship the drugs, the alcohol. That's how addiction takes hold of you. In our addiction group, one of the things that we talk about is that an addiction is a worship problem. You have taken something, a substance, usually, and you put it in the place of God. Could be money. Could be sport. Honestly, football stadiums, you can see they are places of worship for so many people. Uh, or playing sport, people who play sport, they are they're defined by how well they do. Their existence is all about how good their performance is. Could be your job. You know, a lot of people who will live for their job will make sacrifices so that they can get that promotion and climb the ladder. Could be your reputation. Many people build their whole lives upon trying to earn the approval of others, getting that dopamine hit from the Facebook like or it could be that you worship something that's actually really good like your family or your friends that's the idol that dictates everything in your life whatever it is we need to see that we're all worshipers we've been made to worship and whatever it is whether it's good or it's bad here's the truth in the end it's going to let you down because there is nothing this world gives you that it will not eventually take from you. And it's not enough. Why does everyone worship? We worship because we have been made by God to worship God. That's how we function. And one famous early church preacher said this, Our hearts, therefore, will be forever restless until they find their rest in God. And it's only when you come back to the one that you were made for that you can find the rest that your soul desperately needs. These other things that we put in the place of God, good or bad, they are what the Bible calls idols. And if we live for them, we not only destroy ourselves, but the truth is we offend the God who made us. Because in essence, we say to him, shove off, I don't care who you are, you're not the boss of my life, this is what I'm living for, not you. That's damaging. But here's the more dangerous thing. Here's the far more subtle, yet deadly danger. It's when those who call themselves Christians, or those who claim to worship God, in truth, care little for him and their religion is like a mask that they use to hide what it is that they really worship the idols that they really bow down to that was israel at the time of ezekiel if you'd ask them do you follow god the lord they would say yeah of course we're israel but it was fake it's just a mask it was a complete sham and it's one of the reasons why God is so angry with his people. Do you know, in some ways, if you think about like a relationship, if, you, if you're in a relationship and someone says, I don't want anything to do with you, and you walk away, that's hurtful, right? But what's worse is if someone just stays with you and pretends that they like you, but really they're going away and they're flirting with other people and they don't care to hoots about you. That's worse. And that's what Israel was like and the way that they treated God. Their worship was a sham. And Ezekiel is about to get an insight into how bad it was. God is going to peel back the curtain of the religious facade that they built up and he's going to show Ezekiel, look, this is the repeated phrase, do you see? Do you see 
the way these people have treated me. So I've got two points today. This is about idolatry. The first is the problem of idolatry. We'll see God's glory offended. And the second point is the consequence of idolatry. God's glory defended. Let's look at the first point, the problem God's glory offended. So let's look at how it begins. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1. There's Ezekiel. He's sitting in his house. The elders of Judah have come round to his house. Uh, by the way, we're saying this about Ezekiel. He, he has to do kind of a lot of kooky things, um, but people didn't really view him as a kooky person. They respected him. Like he wasn't standing on the street corners of Babylon with a sign saying the end is nigh, and everyone's like, who's this guy? They they really respected him. The people of Israel who are with him in exile knew that he was God's prophet. And so at the start of chapter 8, we've got the elders, that is the political leaders of Jerusalem who had gone into exile with Ezekiel, round Ezekiel's house. And they're probably there looking for some guidance, looking for some hope, looking for some answers. And whilst they're having this meeting, Ezekiel uh, he must go into some kind of trance. I don't know how this would work. Maybe he kind of fell back and it was like a seizure or whatever. But God puts him in this trance and he takes him back to Jerusalem in his mind. He's showing him a vision of what is happening in Jerusalem 700 miles away. So in my head, right, here's how I picture what God is doing with him. Uh, you know on Google Maps, when you want to go into street view and you pick up that little yellow man and you move him along and then just drop him. So it's kind of like God's doing that with Ezekiel in his mind, moving him along 700 miles away and he drops him in Jerusalem outside the temple. And Ezekiel is about to see everything that's going on in the temple. Now, he's not literally there, so he's, I don't know, he's conked out. In the, goodness knows what the elders were thinking. Like, is this guy okay? Do we need to call an ambulance? He's conked out though, but he's having this vision of what's happening 700 miles away. And it's all to do with the temple. Now, before we go on, we need to understand the significance of the temple in Jerusalem. You see, this wasn't just any old building. This is not like Ezekiel's just going back to the church in Jerusalem. The temple was not like a church. The temple in Jerusalem was this unique place at this time and that it was the one place on earth where the glory of God resided. And so God chose Israel to be his special people and his glory, the, the, the visible manifestation of his greatness was present in the temple. Now, all the Israelites knew this. They knew that God isn't confined to a building. They knew that God was everywhere. He was the God of the heaven, uh, heavens and the earth. But it was in this building that the special revealed presence of God was. It was like this building was the connecting point between heaven and earth. It was sacred. There was nothing else like this on the earth. In fact, it's described even here in this vision as being God's house. Now, now can I show you what it looked like? doesn't matter if you said no, because I'm going to show you anyway. You're here. This is quite a good representation of what the temple in Jerusalem looked like. I just wanted to show you that because everyone in Ezekiel's time would have known what this looked like. We don't. We're not that familiar. Uh, so, so there it is. Um, you had this right at the front. This is me getting, going into teacher mode again. My pointer. Can you see it? Uh, right at the front here, that big thing over there, that's the altar where animals would be sacrificed. And so if you were going to the temple, you would take an animal, it would be sacrificed. It was a, a powerful visual image that showed that your wrongdoing needed to be paid for. And it's like the animal would take it in your place. It was an image showing that. Um, so they would have these sacrifices on this altar here. There's a big basin here for the, the priests that the priests would use for getting ceremony clean. Um, and this is the temple here. Inside this little first room where this little priest is, that was called the holy place. Um, only the priests were allowed in there. And then behind was this special room here called the most holy place. No one was allowed in that room uh, apart from the high priest once a year on the day he would make atonement for the, sin, the, the sins of the people. And in this room, you can't really see it there, but in this room, that was where the glory of the Lord was said to reside. And there was something there called the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, in the Ark of the Covenant was kept the Ten Commandments. 
And so God's presence has always been associated with God's word, his commandments, his law. That was where the glory of God was said to be. And those two big creatures on either side uh, were meant to be, they were called cherubim, which is significant for Ezekiel. Uh, So there it is. That's what the temple was about. And everything that the temple did, it was to display the greatness, the majesty, the beauty, and the holiness of God. And Ezekiel is picked up in his mind by his hair for some reason, uh, and he's dropped outside the north gate to this temple. He would have known it well. Ezekiel was a priest, a priest in training, before he was taken off to Babylon uh, as a prisoner. But God wants to give Ezekiel a unique tour of this temple. I don't know if you ever visited a historical site and gone on a tour of it where you've got one of those little audio guides. You done that? Um, You listen to it, you go around, and it tells you, and here's where so-and-so was killed. And uh, Most people don't use the audio guides. They just go and look around the historical site. But I'm a total nerd. And so I'll go through, I want to listen to everything. I want to get all the facts. And so it takes me about three hours to look around anything. Well, in this tour of the temple, the audio guide is God. And he's going to show Ezekiel what is happening. And the one phrase that he will use time and time again is this to describe it. Detestable. What is happening in my house is detestable. Let me change the image. This is kind of a blueprint of the temple, top down. This is the temple. This is the outer wall. Um, I want to show, I want to join Ezekiel on this tour and see what he sees. So the first thing that happened is he's taken outside to the north gate of the temple. And just have a look at verse 5. Here's what he sees first of all. Then God said to me, son of man, look towards the north. So I looked And in the entrance north of the gate of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here. Things that will drive me far from my sanctuary. But you will see things that are even more detestable. So here's the first stop on this tour of apostasy. At the entrance to the north gate of the temple, Ezekiel sees an idol, some kind of statue an idol to a false god. Uh, By the way, that gate, the north gate, would only be used by one person. That was the king in Jerusalem. So evidently this was an idol that was set up by the king that had been put in place by Babylon. And we don't know what this idol was. In some ways it doesn't really matter. All we know is how it made God feel. How did it make God feel? What does he say? It made him jealous. Now, let me stop there because you might think, Well, why is God jealous? Because jealousy for us can often be a petty emotion. Jealousy can be controlling. It can be kind of a revealing of our insecurities. It can come from a a lack of desire to see others happy. And that kind of jealousy is is wrong. But just as we saw last week that there is uh, not all anger is wrong, so we can see this week not all jealousy is wrong. Just a very simple example. If I was to have an affair and my wife was hurt that I betrayed her and given what was only meant for her to another, she would be jealous. And she would be right to be jealous. That jealousy comes from her love and the horror of my betrayal. No one would say to her, that's petty. No, of course, we would sympathize. It's awful. These people They promise to worship God alone, but they have given to false gods what was only meant for him. Do you know, this is what we're going to see in a few weeks. God will frequently compare his relationship to Israel like that of a marriage. He says it's like a marriage to an adulterous spouse. Any chance Israel would get, they would jump into bed with other false gods. It's like your partner having an affair on the honeymoon night and continuing to do it. And God is saying to Ezekiel, do you see? Do you see how these people treat me? These idols show that they have no respect, no love for me. But Ezekiel, I want to show you something even worse. 
And so he takes him on the next stop of this temple tour. And he takes him to a hole in the wall of the temple, into one of the little side rooms. Ezekiel digs through, and here's what Ezekiel sees. He sees the elders worshipping the gods of Egypt. Have a look at verse 9. He said to me, go in and see the wicked and detestable things they are doing. So I went in and looked, and I saw portrayed all over the walls all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals, all the idols of Israel. In front of them stood 70 elders of Israel, and Jahazaniah the son of Shaphan was standing among them. Each had a censer in his hand, and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. So God says, look Ezekiel, I want to take you into the, the side room of the temple here. And I want you to see what I see. And he sees all over the walls in the side of the temple are these images of creeping, creepy crawly things that are being worshipped. Almost certainly this is the false gods of Egypt. The scarab, the snake, the crocodile. These false gods are in God's house and they are being worshipped by the elders. The elders are the political leaders in Jerusalem. And Ezekiel sees this and he's, he's shocked that he's seen this, but he's particularly shocked by one guy he sees, a guy called Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Now, we don't know who Jaazaniah is, but we do know who Shaphan was. Elsewhere in the Bible, 2 Kings chapter 22, Shaphan was described as this good godly man, a man who cared about God, a man who, uh, one of the few faithful Israelites. But Ezekiel sees his son leading the secret worship of these loathsome creatures carved into the walls. Now, these elders, they probably would have said, yeah, we follow God. But secretly, they are looking to the gods of Egypt for their help in the darkness. In fact, there's something almost creepy crawly about the way that they behave. It's often said that you become like the gods you worship. Why are they doing this? Well, verse 12, he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own idol? They say, the Lord does not see. The Lord has forsaken the land. They're doing this because they've tried God and it's not working. I don't think they wouldn't say they completely abandoned him. They're still in his temple. They've tried God, it's not working. Ah, he doesn't help, he doesn't really care, he's abandoned us. You know, we might as well just try something else. But the irony is that they are the ones who have abandoned God. You know, way back, Deuteronomy chapter 4, God says very explicitly, do not worship the animals that crawl along the ground. What a weird thing to say, why say that? Because that's what the Egyptians worshipped. He says, do not worship these idols and they are doing the very thing God said not to do and they have the audacity to say he is silent how quick we can be to blame God so that we can justify our wrongdoing and you know God had rescued these people from from being slaves in Egypt and now her leaders are taking them back back to the lies back to the slavery hiding behind their fake religion this is worse than the idol because it's so sneaky and it's just a blatant disregard for God's law do you see Ezekiel do you see what they are doing to me but I will show you something even worse and so the next stop on the tour, Ezekiel's taken back outside the north gate. And in verse 14, he sees women worshipping the god of Babylon. They are women gathered around a big statue to this god, Tammuz. Uh, he was a, a Babylonian god. Babylon, the enemy. This is the enemy who had destroyed everything, who's going to destroy them. And they are seeking the help of their gods. I mean, this would be like, can you imagine, uh, say, say you're in the Second World War, you're fighting for your country, you're seeing your friends die as you fight against this evil fascist regime of Nazism, and then you come home to find that the people in your hometown have put up swastikas following Hitler. This is the enemy, what are you doing? 
And so these women are, are entreating the help of this god, Tammuz. Uh, Tammuz was a, a dead Babylonian god that they believed you brought back to life through weeping and mourning. That's what they're doing. One of the commentators uh, on this passage expresses, expresses the tragedy of this by saying that worship of the living God has now been replaced by weeping over a dead God. This is worse than the elders in the sense that it's so public, so evil. Do you see, Ezekiel, what they are doing? Do you see how they are treating me? But there's one final stop. And this really is the icing on the cake. Ezekiel is taken right to the very front, outside the holy place. And there he sees men worshipping the sun. Actually, he sees the priests worshipping the sun. Verse 16, he sees 25 men with their backs to God. Uh, literally, in the Hebrew, their backsides to God. Very publicly, defiantly, turning away from God and bowing down to the sun. Uh, by the way, it might sound a bit nuts. That was pretty common practice in the time Ezekiel wrote this. It's like a lot of people worship the sun. And what makes this particularly bad is who is doing this and where they are doing it. You see, that area of the temple was reserved only for the priests. And so it's Israel's spiritual leaders that are the ones defiantly turning their back on God. That part of the temple was where the priests would bring the requests of the people to God. It was the place where the deeds of the Lord were recounted and thanksgiving was to be offered to him. Now it's the place where God's honor is desecrated and his glory is profaned. These priests have willfully turned their back on the creator to bow down instead to the creation. And it's so awful when those who are meant to teach God's people Lead them away from the truth. You see the blasphemy and the horror, and it's all pervasive. It's all throughout society, young and old, men and women, political leaders, spiritual leaders. Ezekiel, do you see? They are treating me like dirt in my own house. This is the partner cheating and having an affair in their spouse's bed. This is the parent giving their child a game, the child loving that game more than the parent, saying to the parent, I hate you, I want nothing to do with you, I only want your gifts. It's the boss having an employee that has no respect, that always turns up late, that mocks and ridicules them. All these illustrations fall short in a way because it's infinitely worse than anything we can do to one another because this is the infinite God, perfect in every way, eternal, majestic, the one that the whole host of heaven bows towards. And here are those whom he has made himself known to and there is no honor, no respect and no love shown by them. All these detestable idols are the equivalent of spitting in God's face. The same God who loved them, who rescued them, who cared for them. And they've done it for so long. And so it's no surprise in verse 18, God says, I've had enough. I've had enough. I'll deal with them in my anger and there will be no pity. I'm done with Jerusalem. Now we need to stop and think seriously about this. Today we don't have a building where we meet with God. He's not in a building. The truth is, all of that was pointing towards a great truth. That when Jesus came, God in the flesh, and died for our sin, it meant that we could be forgiven of all wrongdoing, and we could now be God's temple. God's temple is his people, not a building. But there will be many who claim to carry the name of Jesus and yet don't honor it. What would Ezekiel see if he was given a tour of the churches in Scotland today? If he saw everything that was going on, I know he would see many faithful churches that love Jesus, that love each other and obey his word. 
But we have to be honest. He would also see churches where the glory of God has been defamed by those who should know better. I have heard, as you will have, of churches doing this very thing, having multi-faith services. Ministers who say there's lots of ways to get to God. Ministers who will deny what the Bible says, sex or marriage or issues like God's judgment. And they might applaud themselves and think they are great and inclusive, but in reality, they have turned their back on the one true God to bow down and worship the idols of nature. <laughs> so desperate, so desperate not to offend others, but giving no thought to offending God. Because the truth is they actually worship themselves and their own reputations. We need to watch that that does not become us. I need to watch that does not become me. We don't sideline God, demean him, and put something else in his place in a desperate attempt to try and be relevant. You know, the Corinthian church in the New Testament, there was a real danger that they were doing that. Some of them, they were trying to, they wanted to be so well liked by their culture. And so what they did, they were Christians, and they were coming to church, but they were also going to the local pagan temple and eating and drinking with people there. And this is what the Apostle Paul said to them. Paul does not do multi-faith services, I can tell you that. This is what he said. He said, the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Behind false worship is something demonic. And so you see, this is a warning for the church today. Do not be like Israel of old. But we also need to look at ourselves and be honest. We need to stop and we need to look at our own hearts. We might not be in a multi-faith service. We might not be bowing down to the sun. Certainly not in this country. But we can ask, what is it that we are in danger of putting in place of God? family, money, comfort, the drink, the drugs, the reputation, our jobs. What might I be doing as God's temple that brings dishonor to his name? How might I be in danger of thinking like the elders of Israel did and saying, ah, oh, God, God doesn't see, God doesn't care. I'll try something else to get me through my life. I'll look for security outside of my Savior. How might I be in danger of slipping back to the slavery of my old life before Jesus and turning away from the God who rescued me? The truth is, if we're honest, we're all going to struggle with this. If Ezekiel got a private tour of every thought in my heart that God sees, I would be very ashamed and embarrassed. Detestable, because I'm a sinner. But God doesn't want perfection from these people. What he wants is for them to come back to him with their sin. To not trust in themselves and not ignore him. He says it all throughout the book. Why won't you come back to me? Come to him seeking forgiveness and his help. But here's the truth. And that's what we must do. Here's the truth. They just didn't care. And so there's consequences. Finally, much briefer, the consequence then, God's glory defended. We don't have time to go into the details of chapter 9. The people's voice has been silenced, but God's voice will now be heard. And what he does, and what Ezekiel sees, is uh, dreadful. God calls together a death squad of six men, in verse 2, uh, probably angels. And they are given the task of going through Jerusalem and killing everyone in the city. They are to start at God's house with the priests, and then they will go through and kill everyone. But God gives one man, one angel, uh, with a writing kit, a task, and he is to go ahead of them and put a mark on those who will be protected from this judgment. Now, the Israelites, I think, would have picked up exactly on what's going here. 
This is very reminiscent of a story that happened in their past when they were rescued from Egypt. The story of the Passover. God sent his angel to go through Egypt and to kill all indiscriminately except for those who listened to him and were marked with lamb's blood. And here God is sending his angel, but now it's to go through Jerusalem and to kill all discriminately except for those who are being marked by this other angel. It's as if God is saying, hey, look, if you want to be a pagan nation, I'll treat you like a pagan nation. And it's awful. And we might say, well, it's just a vision. But this literally did happen. It wasn't angels, but six years after Ezekiel saw this, the Babylonians returned to Jerusalem. They killed everyone in the city. They razed the city to the ground and they destroyed the temple of God. But Ezekiel's vision makes it clear Babylon didn't do it, God did. God did this. To profane his glory and to spit in his face and ignore his offer of salvation is to face judgment. And Jesus makes it clear if we don't come to him, we will all face that judgment. And it will be far worse than anything that we read of in Ezekiel. In fact, the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 4 that judgment begins with the household of God, with those who claim to follow him but care nothing for him. Serious, serious stuff. But the final word in this vision, we've only seen the first half of it, but even here in chapter 9, we can see the final word is not judgment but hope. You see, not everyone is going to face this. That one angel has that special job to mark out a group of people that will not face it. Look at verse 4. And God said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. And right at the end of verse 11, we read that the, the man in the linen with the writing kit at his side brought back words saying, I have done as you commanded. He went through, he marked some for protection. There was a group that was protected. Why were they protected? Was it because they were perfect, because they were sinless, because they never did any wrong? No, they were protected because they grieved and lamented over the detestable things that were done in Jerusalem. They were protected because they cared about God. They followed him. The truth is, folks, we are all idolaters. We have all offended God and we will all have to answer to our maker. And we're in a bad way, but Jesus came to save us from any judgment we deserve. And if you genuinely follow Jesus this morning, you need to know you are completely safe. He took all God's anger that you and I deserve on himself. And as he died on that cross, he was punished so that you would never, ever have to fear punishment. He let the sword of judgment fall on himself so that you could be protected. This God is great and majestic and set apart. And what sets God apart from all creation is his love. And that's what makes the mistreatment of him so vile. But he loves the people who hated him so much so that he would come and suffer our judgment in our place so that we could be forgiven for how we might have offended him. So how do I know that I'm a genuine follower of Jesus who is completely safe? Well, you know that it's you. You know that it's real because you take seriously what God says and you lament over your sin, and you repent of it, and you trust in Jesus. If that's you, you're safe, completely safe. In fact, right at the very end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the apostle John uses this imagery from Ezekiel 9 to describe what will happen at the end of time. And in Revelation 14 verse 1, he says that, those who follow Jesus, it's as if they have been marked. They've been branded. But they've been branded with the name of Jesus. And so they are protected from any judgment. That's the name that protects us. It's our Savior. And if you, are follow, if you follow him, you are branded with him. He is yours and you are his. We are safe. And also just to know that we are safe, to be with him, is to know an assurance and a love like no other. This is the God that we are made for, that no idol 
can give you what he can give you. And so we turn from it and we come to the one who wants to save. We come and find rest for our souls that only he can give. Let me pray. Take some questions. Father God, thank you for your word and challenging, difficult passage to read, to understand, to apply. And yet, Father, we pray that you would help us to look at this and to take seriously the, the sin of idolatry. Father, help us to be obedient to you as a church, not to put other things in your place. Help us to put to death the idols of our heart, so many things that can easily come and we can use to supplant you. And Father, may we be aware of it, may we lament over it, may we repent of our sin and trust that Jesus has forgiven us of all our wrongdoing. Father, may we know your love and mercy so we give ourselves wholeheartedly to you, knowing that that is the best way to live, knowing that we have a love and an assurance and a safety that nothing on this world can give. Help us to take seriously your glory, to live for your glory, and to honor your name, we pray. Amen. Folks, let me take some... Any questions about that before we finish and sing our final song? Yeah. In chapter 6, God saves some from the sword. Yeah. Then in chapter 8, he saves the ones who are grieving. Did yeah. Did you know that he's taken out the bad from the good? You know what I mean? Yeah. Did it know that not everybody's going to be slaughtered? No. It's like when you put a wash on, you don't mix the whites with the dark. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think... Yeah. Speaking of faithful, yeah. 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 There's, the, yeah. There's kind of like, it's unsure whether or not that angel actually marked anyone. Um, Ezekiel, I didn't look at this, but in verse 8, when he sees it, he, he's really freaked out. He's like, this is it. We're done for. And he's like, God, are you going to destroy everyone? And God doesn't really seem to say yes or no. He just says, look, they're, they're getting what they deserve. Um, but we'll see, this is half the vision, we'll see when we look at 10 and 11 next week, that actually God has a very special plan for a group that he's set apart, Ezekiel included. Yeah, and like ones that are saved are going to have a fear of the Lord in their heart. They're going yeah. To, they're going to know what's happening. Yeah. You know? I think it's worth saying as well, this, was, this, this is not like, um, we've got to draw a distinction between what Israel was like back then and what we are like today. So there's a difference between someone who's struggling with sin, the sin of idolatry. There's one teach, Bible teacher who says that our hearts are idol factories. They're constantly producing idols. And as long as we're aware of that and repenting, that's different than someone who's saying, God, I don't care about you. And they're just using their religion as a mask to do what they want. Um, and, and that's a really important distinction to have. And so as Christians, we should be assured of how safe we are in Jesus yeah. from that. If you trust Jesus, you're the faithful remnant. Even if it doesn't mean being perfect, it just means that you're aware of your sin and you lament over it and you take it to God. That's a good sign. If you don't care about your sin, that's a bad sign. If you care and you like, I really want to honor God, I'm struggling to do that, you need to be aware. Yeah, you need to, yeah, you need to know that's, that's a good sign that God's at work in your life. Um, but they, they didn't care. I mean, they set up a statue right in the middle of the temple that they bowed down to. It was quite obvious they didn't care. Is it like, uh, uh. Is it not sort of like the senses of like, it's every day, it's essentially not. Yep. I mean, you think, oh, you just do it once, you know, yeah. but every day. Like, yeah. And like, you've got a sense of it, I've got a yeah. sense of it. Yeah. Every Christian's got to do that. Yeah. To help as, soon, as soon as you stop doing that, you get into dangerous territory because you start to think, I'm great, I've got it sorted and you're unaware of the idolatry, the sin that's in your own life. Um, and it's just constantly bringing it, saying, I need you. That's why we do a confession of sin every Sunday as well, because um, we're, we're all sinners here. Um, and we honor God, not by being perfect, but by trusting in him and his perfect son. The more you become a Christian, the more you fall in faith, the more sin in your life you actually see. Aye, ah, yeah, definitely. So religion never repents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It just, and then the more amazing grace becomes because Jesus has forgiven you of all that sin. That's what's good about the gospel. 
and our Savior. Um, James, sorry, you had your hand up. Yeah. Yep. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And the thing that marks you, so it's an image, it's not literal. So people love that bit in Revelation because it talks about those who have the mark of the beast and it's 666 and, you know, heavy metal fans love that. Um, and it's nothing to do with numbers or literal marks on your head. It's to do with where your allegiance lies in your heart. And if your allegiance is to Jesus, and then it's like you're marked with him, you know, we're united to him, we're branded with him, his name is on us, and that's what saves us, defines us, protects us. Um, so it's not literal, but everything in Revelation, most of it comes from Daniel and Ezekiel. And so if you want to understand the book of Revelation, which is very confusing, starting with Ezekiel is a good place. Um, and I think that's John draws on that imagery when he's describing it too. Um, yeah. 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 Oh, is it? I don't know that. I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, Yeah, I, yeah I, don't know, I don't know enough about that. If so, that would be awful if they did that and brought Tammuz in. I think that's the whole thing. They're bringing in these deities from other cultures rather than just trusting the God who, who speaks. And these, these idols don't say anything. And God speaks to them and they're ignoring him. Um, so. Okay. Let's uh, finish by singing. And we'll sing this uh, great hymn, Flee from Sin. So let's stand and sing, and please remain standing for the closing benediction.
turn in repentance from my sin. God provides all the help I need to persevere. Praise His name that my life is bound in Him. Praise His name that my life is found in Him. There is power in the finished work of Jesus to change up the sinners just like me. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please do have a seat. Tea and coffee will be served.